Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. In this week's video we venture to one of South Yorkshire's most dramatic and imposing structures. The castle here at Connersborough, near Doncaster, has stood at the centre of Norman rule for almost a thousand years. Housed within a stunning picturesque landscape and perched strikingly above the Don Valley, in a naturally defensive position, is it any wonder that Sir Walter Scott supposedly chose it as an inspiration for the castle in his novel, Ivanhoe? So why not join us as we explore the remains of mighty Conisbra Castle? Likely a royal estate and minster of the Anglian kings of Northumbria, Conisbra, though today a mere town, was once a significant settlement and that would only grow following the 1066 Norman Conquest, as William the Conqueror presented the honour of Conisbra to formidable nobleman William de Warren. At this time, the site likely compromised a timber palisade perched upon a bailey. It is Earl Hamelin Plantagenet, Henry II's half-brother, who we should thank for the stark white circular limestone stone keep which is probably the first example of a circular stone keep in England that still remains to this day, which has been dated to the 1170s or 1180s. The embracing curtain wall and inhabited buildings which line within likely followed soon after. The spectacular white keep of Conisbra is built of magnesian limestone. As you approach it from the bottom of the steep hill, Raising your head to take it all in, the imposing structure, it becomes both more impressive to the modern eye and more oppressive to the medieval one, as you can imagine the inhabitants of the village of long ago that would scurry around its edges about their daily business. Although stone from the outer walls have long since been robbed, the keep remains tall and smooth and virtually whole, which was a testament to the awe in which it was held. The Great Stone Keep, which dates from around 1180, is unique in its design in this country, being cylindrical but with six huge buttresses around it which gives it that polygonal shape. This would make it immensely strong in the case of any attack, either from men or from the stone-throwing siege machinery of the time, and even to the modern eye the keep is clearly built with defence rather than display in mind as it has very few windows and these are only small and high up in the walls. The entrance is at first floor level via a wooden staircase which could be burnt in times of trouble, leaving attackers with no means of entrance. This staircase brings those entering into a storeroom with only a hatch leading back down to the ground, not a dank and dark dungeon as many normally assume, but another secure store, which itself contains access to the well shaft, which would ensure the keep could be self-contained, even in the outer and inner wards, should it be captured. The lowest two storeys were deliberately made more or less derelict. The room at entrance level has no windows and no fireplace, whilst the vault below it was completely dark, with only access through an opening in the centre of its vault. Another reason why Conisborough is unique is for its lack of English comparison in regards to the keep. Although it is loosely similar in design to Henry II's polygonal keep at Orford Castle, which was one of the first things that I thought of when we were visiting here, is how similar in design the keep is. But it relates more closely to William de Warren's cylindrical and polygonal donjons in France in Normandy. The Warrens had two major castles on their Norman estates, one of them named Mortimer Castle, which is now neglected ruins, but they show Mortimer Castle to be a ruinous cylindrical keep with six semi-circular buttresses, which was a smaller and much simpler version than the one here at Conisborough. The stairways are set into the thickness of the huge walls, and as you ascend in the atmospheric gloom, it's easy to imagine travelling back in time to the castle's heyday. This room would have been used by the de Warren lords when they were staying in Conisborough. 
It looks cold and bare today, but it would have once contained a number of fine objects and silverware, with painted furniture, beds with feather mattresses, and colourful rugs on the floor, and tapestries on the walls to keep out the cold. A long trestle would have been used for meals, feasts, banquets and so on. A wide fireplace with a jogged lintel and possibly a colourful hood would have thrown out heat into the room. A door leads into a latrine and there is an alcove with a window overlooking the entrance to the tower. The spaces would have been filled with wall hangings and furniture that the Lord and Lady brought with them as they travelled throughout their estate creating a more comfortable home than the cold stone interiors that you visit today. The steward managed the estate throughout the year and attended to Hamlin and Isabel when they were in Conisborough. The stairs leading to the third floor are narrower than the lower ones. This floor consists of the bedchamber, where the Lord and his family could rest and sleep. It would have been beautifully decorated and had a large comfortable bed with fluffy cushions. This room also featured a large basin for washing and a latrine. A window alcove faced out towards the town, with stone benches that would have been cushioned so people could sit, rest and chat. A beautiful fireplace once provided heat out into the room, and a chapel within one of the buttresses on the east of the tower opened from the bedchamber. The de Warren family would have attended mass here in private, and the priest, who would have more than likely lived at the castle, would pray for their souls. The second floor chamber with its attendant chapel in particular may have been interpreted as a private woman's space for Countess Isabel de Warren and the ladies of her chamber. The chapel's most notable feature is the beautiful vaulted ceiling. Any doubts of allegiance to the Plantagenets were remedied here in the chapel. Placed in the centre of the ceiling is a silver penny cross that is surrounded by a plant, common broom flower. The Plantagenet flower used in the crest of both Geoffrey of Anjou and Henry II. The couple's desire to demonstrate the familial pride and affiliation is demonstrated in the shape of the keep and through the ornament in the chapel. Although the couple came to Conisborough through Isabel de Warren's inheritance, these two elements are telling of an attempt by the couple to celebrate their Plantagenet roots. The polygonal shape may have been popular in the mid-12th century, but if that style was made fashionable by Henry, Hamlin and Isabel's adoption of the style made the statement that they were dutifully following later on. The representation of the broom flower in the chapel also signifies the de Warren couple who believed in Henry's divine right to rule in the Conisborough Chapel. Support for God's chosen king is indicated by the inclusion of the family insignia, which is presented in the highest point of the space. The rooftop forms the fifth floor. Originally, it did look quite different to how it looks today. It is thought that at some time there was a room surrounded by an enclosed wall passage, as part of the wall and door jam still survive. One of the six buttresses that extend above the battlements as turrets, two of them were solid. The other four seem to have functioned as two water tanks, a bread oven and a dovecote. But on a great day like we experienced, you can see for miles and soak in the feelings of a lord back in the 12th century, scouring the area and looking at his estate. With a strong story of English royalty in place, is there a need to recognise other Conisborough tenants? The several other residents included Isabel and Hamlin's son, William, William's son, John the 7th Earl of Surrey, and John's son, John the 8th Earl of Surrey. After the fall of the de Warren family in 1347, Conisborough fell into the hands of the House of York, under Edmund of Langley. 
Edmund was a trusted uncle of King Richard II and was left in charge of the kingdom when Richard II campaigned in Ireland in 1399. In Richard's absence, another of Edmund's nephews, Henry Bolingbroke, the Duke of Lancaster, took the throne and became the first Lancastrian king. As Edmund agreed to the Lancastrian takeover, he was still considered a valuable member of the court. This is especially true after his marriage to Isabella of Castile. Moving forward, Conisborough was inherited by Edmund and Isabella's second son, Richard, later called Richard of Conisborough, but after his untimely demise involved in the Southampton plot. The castle was left to his second wife, Maud Clifford. Maud was the last to call Conisborough Castle home. The final part of our explore took us around the Inner Bailey. The curtain wall you see was once lined with buildings on its north, south and its western sides, although now only the footings and stumps of walls survive. They date from around two main phases, the mid to late 12th and the early 14th century. The castle was made famous by Sir Walter Scott's book Ivanhoe. Ivanhoe is the story of one of the remaining Anglo-Saxon noble families at a time when the nobility in England was overwhelmingly Norman. A historical romance novel by Walter Scott was published in 1819. Inside the small museum here at Conisborough, you can see more on the connection and read about the film, the comic book and the novel itself. It really is quite interesting. We've really enjoyed our time here at Conisborough. Even with its bare walls, it does give the opportunity to be able to imagine life back then and you get to experience a real medieval castle. But of course the English heritage have dotted interactive and informative information around the castle to give a great idea to the rooms, the history and some of the things that you might find inside. There is a separate building though where you can purchase your ticket for entrance and you're able to enjoy a small and interesting museum. So we really hope that you've enjoyed our visit today to Conisborough Castle and that it's given you some insight into life inside a Plantagenet castle. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button, consider subscribing to the channel and even consider supporting us through hitting the notification bell or joining us here on YouTube as channel members. We want to say a big thank you to our Patreons and our members. So we'll see you on the next one. Till next time.